Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to designing a low noise four channel DAC circuit with the MAX 5134 from Analog Devices. And this is part two in a two part series. Before I get started, I'll just mention, please support Forstronics on Patreon, where you can find exclusive content from my videos, including exclusive content from this video series. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel. And if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get started. All right, so this video series kind of has two focuses, right? It's first, it's focusing on how to implement the MAX 5134 four-channel DAC IC, which we covered a lot in part one. And once again, we follow the data sheet closely to know how we're going to do that. And then also, how do we create this low noise circuit bed for our DAC IC to ensure we're getting the best accuracy and the best useful or the most useful resolution out of our DAC IC? So in part one, we talked a lot about the implementation of the DAC. We talked about some of the low noise techniques for putting our schematic together and our circuit design together. And then in part two, we're going to focus first on a couple demos. Then we're going to talk about PCB layout practices related to ensuring we have low noise and high accuracy from our DAC. So I'm actually going to start with a demo just so you can see the circuit in action. Then I'll get into the PCB layout. Then we'll finish with another demo where we show the consequences of not having a nice, clean voltage reference signal for our DAC. And if you want to access the hardware design files, the bomb, the code from the demo in this series, you can get them from the Forstronics Patreon page. All right, let's check out the demo. Okay, here's our four channel DAC circuit right here. And uh, I'll go over you know, the different parts of this uh, after this demo, but a lot of the parts here are the inputs and over here are the outputs. I'm using an Arduino Nano Every to control it. And I'm just using sort of the uh, default spy settings. So that's what's gonna be creating our signals. We have a four channel DAC, remember? So we have channel one, two, three, and four. Now in this demo, I'm gonna just do one volt out of channel one, two volts out of channel two, and three volts out of channel three. And then channel four, I'm going to output a sine wave. And then we're going to start off, though, by measuring the voltage reference. So if you remember, we have this high accuracy voltage reference on our circuit. And this jumper allows us to use that voltage reference, or we can remove the jumper and use an external one. So I have the jumper on, and I have the DMM connected to the voltage reference pin, which will allow us to measure what the voltage reference is. And that's how we'll start this video. So I'm just gonna kind of hold up the wire the DMM is connected to, to kind of show where we're connected. And here is my high accuracy, high resolution DMM. And you can see we're measuring the voltage reference here. And so the voltage reference is 4.096 nominal value. We're seeing about that. We're a little off, but pretty close, less than one millivolt of air. And what I'm gonna show here is how stable it is, right? This is a very stable voltage we're already looking out to hundreds of microvolts, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the integration time. So when you change the integration time on your DMM, it, it means you're chasing, changing how long it measures that signal, samples it before it displays it on the screen. So by upping the measurement time, you get higher resolution. And right now we have it at one NPLC. NPLC stands for number of power line cycles. You don't have to worry necessarily what that means, but right now it's basically measuring about 17 millisecond window. And as we increase that to higher values, we get more resolution. So now we're up to 10, and then I'm gonna go up to 100. And so we're getting resolution out to tens of micro. And notice how stable that signal is, out to tens of micro volts. You know, we're not at exactly 4.096, but we're close. And one thing I'll mention, and I hope I'm not getting too much in the weeds, is this DMM is a high accuracy DMM, but it hasn't been calibrated in over a decade. So it's hard to tell exactly where this inaccuracy is coming from. It might be a little of both. It could be more on the DMM or it could be more on the voltage reference. But the point is, is very high accuracy, less than one millivolt of air showing on this DMM. Could be even less depending on the DMM's air and very stable signal. And that's what we want in our voltage reference. As a reminder from part one, the DAC depends on a stable ground and the stable voltage reference for setting all the voltages in between. So if the DAC is set 16-bit DAC, if all 16 of those bits are ones, we should expect around this value out of the DAC. And if they're all zeros, we should expect ground and then everything in between depending on how we 
we set those 16 bits. So I'm just turning it back a little bit. So we're gonna go down here and I'm gonna move the DMM to DAC output one. So this should be one volt, right? That's what we're expecting here. And you can see we have about one volt, really close. Now these numbers over here are moving. So now we have down to one micro to, because we have a, we're at the one volt range of the DMM. We have down to one micro. So we see some movement at 10 and one micro, but that's really pretty good, right? We're getting pretty good accuracy and stability for this signal down to hundreds of microvolts. So very happy with how that came out. We're gonna check channel two, which is gonna be two volts which will change the DMM's range. So we won't get quite as much resolution, but we still get tens of micro. Then we're gonna to go to three volts. And we can see that that's pretty stable too. Just a little wiggle at the 10 microvolt range. And then I'm just gonna show kind of for fun, the channel four, which is our sine wave. It is jumping a little bit, but I, that's not really the DAC. I, you know, the best way to create the sine wave would have been to use a timed interrupt, and I just put it in the main loop. So I think that's just a, a little variance in Arduino's main loop. But yeah, you can see the sine wave there. So that's it for that demo. Okay, now that we've seen our circuit in action, we know that it's working. Let's just remind ourselves some of the things we want to make sure we do when we design a circuit like this, especially re related to the PCB layout. So the separate ground plane, we wanna make sure we keep our sensitive signals, which is namely the voltage reference and the DAC on its own ground plane so that we don't have noise from the ground plane that's gonna you know, find its way on our traces or affect our power supplies or voltage reference and cause noise and inaccuracies on our DAC signals. So that's one thing we wanna make sure we do. There's different ways to isolate ground planes we're going to use the single point connection method for isolating our two ground planes. So that means they're only connected at a single point. I do have a video series where I talk about this in more detail from years ago, if you want to check that out. We're going to use low ESR bypass capacitors, and we're going to make sure that they're close to the IC power inputs and power output pins. And we talked about in part one, that's important because we want to have very little parasitics in the traces, inductance and resistance, between those IC pins and the capacitors so the IC pins can pull energy from those capacitors as it needs it. We want to keep our digital signals, namely our spy communication and our power supply signals away from our sensitive traces, the DAC signals and the voltage references. We're doing a two layer board just because this is sort of a simple circuit that I'm trying to demo. But if you do a four layer board in those type of situations, we then want to bury our sensitive signal paths, namely the voltage references and the DAC signals, typically in an internal layer of the PCB and use the ground plane on either side, the top and the bottom to sort of shield that from any external EMI. A lot of times that's not a big issue, but if you're working in sort of an industrial environment where maybe there's electric motors or something, that you can have a high EMI environment and you might wanna shield your sensitive signal paths. We don't focus on that on our circuit, but just keep that in mind. We're gonna look at the PCB layout, but I just wanted to start with the schematic real quick to kind of show you this is our single point ground connection, right? So I say our grounds are isolated, but they're not really isolated. They're just connected at a single point. And so ground, GND, is our noisier ground. And when I say noisy, I mean electrical noisy. And A ground or analog ground is our quieter or less electrical noisy ground. And that's where we have the voltage reference and our DAC on there. So here we're looking at the board layout. So this is the same board layout you saw in the demo. This is a two layer board, top and bottom. And so the red is the top layer and blue is the bottom layer. So all the components are on the top layer. That's why you see a lot of red. And then we have a couple paths on the bottom layer. These green uh, connections are our pins, right? Our solder holes for our pins. They're 2.54 millimeter spacing and they're green. Green means that it's a part that's going through the whole board from the top layer to the bottom layer. So down here is where we have our power coming into the board. So we have this on the opposite side of where we have our DAC, our DAC's over here. So we have our power coming in and we have all those bypass caps, which I talked about in part one. When you have an unknown power source, you wanna use a lot of different bypass caps because you don't know what the switching power supply's frequency might be, 
or how noisy that power supply might be versus someone else's power supply. So we have a lot of different caps here. We have our ferrite bead, and then we feed that into our five volt linear regulator. And as a reminder, we chose that five volt linear regulator because it has a good PSRR spec or power supply rejection ratio spec. So it's good at attenuating input power noise from its output. And once again, notice how I have the bypass caps for the input and output of that linear regulator right near the pins, right? Because that's one of the things we wanted to make sure we do. Now, this red outline here and this blue outline here, these represent the ground plane. So if I turn on the ground planes, you can kind of see this split going through the board, right? This is our ground over here, our noisier ground, and this is our quieter ground. And I have connections for the analog ground on both sides of the board, but notice this analog ground actually has to run all the way back to this to connect to this analog ground. So that's how we get the analog ground from here to there. And if I zoom in here, we can see our single point connection. I put it on the bottom layer, right? Because our DAC signals are on the top layer. So we want, we want that return current, right? Because current has to have a closed loop, right? So if you have current flowing to the DAC IC, it has to return back, right? So we want it to not flow around our voltage reference or our DAC. We want it to go to the bottom layer and return to the power source down there. And notice that I have the single point connection in between the voltage reference and the DAC. Try and prevent the current flowing right near one of those ICs. Okay, if you remember, the linear regulator is creating a 5-volt bus, and this ferrite bead separates the digital 5-volt bus from the analog 5-volt bus. So that's the only thing that sort of separates them. The whole reason is the spy communication can cause noise on the power supply bus. And so by isolating the analog and digital, we prevent that noise from the spy communication from coming over from the digital line. Ferrite beads, they're great for high frequency. So a ferrite bead, if you're talking about tens of kilohertz of noise or hundreds of kilohertz of noise, ferrite bead's gonna not attenuate that that much. But when you're working with spy and megahertz clock frequencies, that's where a ferrite bead starts to attenuate noise is when you get into the megahertz or even tens of megahertz range. So we feed that analog supply to our voltage reference IC, which is right here. Once again, the capacitors are real close to the pins. We then output that voltage reference and we have that jumper that you saw in the video. In the video, we had it closed. And then that reference goes into our DAC. And once again, that establishes the ceiling of the DAC. We don't want that reference jumping around because that'll cause our DAC voltage to jump around. And then of course we have the linear voltage, the analog one going to the DAC IC as well as the digital one. And then, of course, we want to make sure our DAC outputs, which are here, DAC 1, 2, 3, and 4, that they don't have any noisy signals coming through them, right? So we don't want our spy lines to come, you know, uh, parallel right next to them or even perpendicular crossing them. So we make sure we don't do that. Now, for this simple circuit, that's not that hard to do. But when you're working with a much more crowded circuit where you have a lot of things going on, Sometimes it can be tricky to really isolate uh, noisy signals from these uh, sensitive signals, so keep that in mind. We do output our 5-volt analog signal, which is not a big deal, but uh, in practice, I probably wouldn't do that. I would probably keep that 5 volts uh, off the uh, analog ground plane as much as possible, but for this demo board, it, that didn't matter too much. Okay, so let's look at another demo of our design in action. This time we're going to use an external voltage reference to kind of show what happens if you don't have a great voltage reference and it has some noise on it. How does that affect your output DAC values? Okay, here we're looking at our same setup and same circuit. We have our DAC circuit board and we have our Arduino Nano Every. And we're running the same software, right? So we have the same DAC outputs, but this time we have the voltage reference jumper off. And so I'm using a 14-bit function generator to feed that reference in there. So it's probably not gonna be quite as accurate as the built-in reference, but it will be a pretty stable voltage. So right now we'll start with it set at a DC value, and I'll show that. So we have this, so we're looking at our three volt output. So this would be DAC channel three, right? So we're seeing three volts out. It's a little different value because we're using a different reference, right? But it's still pretty stable because the function generator's reference is stable. So the function generator right now is just set up for a DC output of 4.096 volts. 
Now, what I'm going to do here is I have a saved signal that I'm going to output, which is basically a DC level with some digital noise on it. So I'm going to select that. It's going to output it. So here we have an offset, which is basically a DC value of 4.096, which is what we had before. But I have these random digital signal at 100 kilobytes per second or kilobits per second and a really small amplitude, 5 millivolts peak to peak. So that's riding on top of this DC level. So we're going to see the effect of this. So let's look at that same DAC value. Now, this is the same DAC value, but notice in the hundreds of micro where we were pretty stable, we now see that jumping around, and that's due to that noise. We even see the, the millivolt value jumping around, so that's due to that noise. Now, let's see what happens if we, we up that digital noise to a higher level. So now we're at 20 millivolts peak to peak. Now we can really see it jumping around even in the millivolt range. So you can kind of see the effects as if you have a noisy voltage reference, you can see the effects. Now, I'm going to get a little into the weeds here. I have a pretty low frequency digital signal. Now, what happens if I up that digital signal to a much higher value? So I think I'm going to do about 50 kilobits per second. So there we go, 50 kilobits per second. Notice the signal is much more stable. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is because my DMM is sampling. I, I don't remember exactly what it's set for, but I think it's set for two power line cycles or one power line cycle right now. And so what happens is all that you get much more noise in a more condensed time frame. And so what happens is the DMM is sort of just averaging that out because it's doing a long measurement. If you have a DAC where you're changing the signal a lot, like you have a high bandwidth DAC and you're changing the signal a lot, this 50 kilobits will have a much bigger effect. But since I'm measuring it over a long period of time, it's getting canceled out. So anyway, I just thought that might be interesting to see. All right, that's it for designing a low noise four channel DAC circuit with the MAX 5134. And this is part two in a two part series. I hope you liked this video series. It was a fun one to put together. If you have any questions or if anything wasn't clear, please use the comment section. And if you have anything to add, if you think I missed anything, please use the comment section. And if you wanna access the material from this video, the design files, the bomb, the Arduino code, you can find it on Patreon. Thank you for watching.